I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Hi. How is everyone? Great. Great. My name is Afton Thomas. I am the Associate Director for Programs here at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. Before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I have a few announcements. Our South Talk series is a team effort. So thank you to the Center's communication specialist, Rebecca Cleary, who spreads the word about the events, Kel Kellum for his assistance with front of the house duties, MA graduate student, Brittany Brown, responsible for creating the amazing event graphics and the Center's newsletter, MFA graduate student, Amy Talbot, for her expertise behind the camera, she records and edits each talk before posting on the center's YouTube channel, making sure they are accessible after the event. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Now, to introduce our South Talk speaker. Did you know the month of March is considered Women's History Month? And this coming Friday is International Women's Day. So although we don't need a month or a day to recognize or celebrate women, it's extra appropriate when the stars align. So this is the case with today's South Talk. Linda Janet Holmes, former director of the New Jersey Health Department Office of Minority and Multicultural Health, began recording interviews with traditional African American midwives decades ago. Her most recent book, Safe in a Midwife, Midwife Pan, Birthing Traditions from Africa to the American South, focuses on the practices of black midwives whose holistic approaches are essential counterbalances to a medical system that routinely fails black mothers and babies. Her award-winning book, Listen to Me Good, The Life Story of an Alabama Midwife, was co-authored with Margaret Charles Smith, a legendary Greene County, Alabama midwife, and documents the contributions of a singular black midwife. A past faculty member of the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey Nurse Midwife Program, Holmes now lives in Hampton, Virginia. Her previously published books also include A Joyous Revolt, Tony K. Bambara, Writer and Activist, and Savoring the Salt, The Legacy of Tony K. Bambara, co-authored with Cheryl Wall. Please help me welcome <laughs> Ms. Linda J. Holmes. Well, first of all, I need to say good morning. <laughs> and also, I need to say that this is my first time in Mississippi, first time on campus, and the welcoming has been absolutely wonderful. I'm going to begin with a reading and end with a reading. So let me begin with a reading from the book. Decades before interviewing traditional midwives in Africa, I spent six months in Alabama listening to the stories of a last generation of black lay midwives who preserved and continued culturally rich birthing traditions. In 1981, I never imagined that 40 years later I would travel to Kenya, Ghana, and Ethiopia to document parallels between birthing traditions on the continent and the practices that had been passed on to Alabama midwives by their elders and ancestors, some of whom had been born in Africa. My conversations with midwives in Africa confirmed that despite the horrors of the Middle Passage, the era of enslavement, Jim Crow segregation, eugenics and unrelenting biases against black women, the Alabama midwives I had met had succeeded in preserving a way of birthing that had its roots in the continent, continue, continued to be spiritually based and holistic, and most importantly, saved lives. Deciding to live in Montgomery, I rented a small furnished house with a yard that even had a clothesline where a wire pinned between poles provided color to the yard when I hung out clothes to dry. My first week there, my neighbor showed off her southern hospitality, which she began dropping by on Fridays with fresh caught fish, clean and ready to fry. A few blocks away, Lily Baptist Church offered the perfect Sunday morning mix of black gospel 
and spirituals for finding the peace of mind I had found in breathing exercises and meditations in yoga classes before moving to Alabama. I later learned how midwives on the continent described chants, invocations, intuition, and religiously based traditional healers as among the ways that spirituality infused their practices. But years before going to Africa, I learned how deeply interwoven prayer and other expressions of faith are among all the black midwives I interview. Grandmothers and great-grandmothers born in the era of enslavement contributed to how significantly spiritual practices shaped the institution of Southern black midwives. So I thought I would begin um, just a little bit more about talking about why it is I decided to go to the continent. Um, as I said in my opening reading, I was, um, in 1981, I was living in New Jersey. I was, um, I had given birth to my daughter in the 19, late 1970s. So I was a new mom, single mom. And I had made a list, the midwives who might be here in the room, I had made a list of all my demands. I had been really involved with the black student movement. So I had my birthing demands. I wanted to be able to um, be awake and aware for the birthing experience. I wanted my partner, I wasn't married at the time, I wanted my partner with me at the time of birth. I wanted minimal use of drugs and other um, interventions. Uh, I wanted to be awake and aware, but that's not what happened. Um, and so it was the fire, it was kind of like the fire that I felt during the black student movement when I was on campus, making demands about more black teachers, more black faculty. I had that same fire started burning in me as a woman, as a black woman, in terms of what I wanted to see in my own birthing experience. And my first work after completing my master's in public administration was at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. And I was fortunate enough to work with the nurse midwife program. So I thought, wow, I'm now at a university and I can now talk about and work with midwives who would be able to promote the kinds of ideas that I was interested in. But before I graduated from Rutgers, I, which is where I uh, studied for my master's in public administration, I prepared a questionnaire um, that was, those of you who are students, you know, I went to my faculty, they approved the questionnaire, and I went to the chair of the department of obstetrics at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. And I said, I want to interview women in Newark, New Jersey, urban city, lots of low-income women, many of them on Medicaid. And I wanted to ask them, what kind of an experience would they like to have at the time of birth? And I asked them questions like, would you like to be awake and aware? Would you like to have your baby with you afterwards? And so forth, breastfeed. And literally what happened was the chair of the department tore my questionnaire into pieces. And he said, you don't understand. These are poor women. These women are not married. Many of them are addicted. They are not going to be interested in the questions that you're asking. Well, that, my first fire was the black student movement. That was my second fire. <laughs> so that was the time that I said, you know, I, I really think that this is my calling. We talk about midwives having a calling. I thought, oh, this is my calling, right? And so even though I've done various kinds of work in the last 40 years, this idea of documenting and staying involved with the women's health movement has been the calling that I have been involved with for some time. And I can talk a lot. And we haven't even put on the first slide. <laughs> um, so when I went to the continent, I was interested in illuminating the traditions that I'd heard from when talking to midwives in Alabama. I had a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and that's moving to Alabama, you know, with my clothesline, <laughs> the fried fish, going to church on Sunday. Um, but meeting and interviewing midwives, and what was the miracle of it all is that they didn't know me. I had my Honda Civic with a New Jersey license plate, <laughs> right? Um, and I didn't have a, I had one really good friend in Alabama and she was very helpful with the work I did in Selma and Dallas County. But the midwives were so honored to have someone come and collect their stories because their practices had just been 
disseminated in Alabama and across the South. And that happened, and in Virginia, which is where I live. Up and through the 1950s, the majority of black women born in the South were attended by black midwives. Prior to that time, a significant number of white women born in the South were also attended by midwives. And that was something that many of the midwives wanted to point out to me, that they, weren't, they were attending black women in their communities, but there were also white women, particularly in the 70s, as the idea of natural childbirth was developing, were choosing home birth, um, were really excited about having an opportunity to tell their stories. And what I learned from these midwives is what you're seeing there on this um, slide, and I'm going to go to the next slide, um, because this whole idea of Sankofa, going back to get it, we talk about that a lot during Black History Month, the idea of not just looking back, but finding treasures and things to honor when we look back. And when I was in Alabama, it was often thought when I talked to nurse midwives and doctors, anthropologists, that what I was seeing as traditions, they were seeing as superstitions. That they were seeing as things that were backwards. That they were seeing as things that didn't reflect their, their education or their lack of education. One of the most stunning midwives I interviewed had attended 3,000 births in Alabama. And she's now, she's been honored, she's not living now, but she was honored by the Congressional Black Caucus. She's in the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame. Um, and so she was obviously doing a lot of things right. Um, and she was also working with the health department. She was working with the nurse midwife. Um, I had a chance to document um, her stories. And the things that she was doing were not just what she learned from her work, from working with doctors and nurse midwives or going to, the, um, to Tuskegee where they had a training program, but it was also reflective of what she learned from her grandmother, what she learned from her grandmother who was born in Africa. And so I went to Ethiopia, I went to Kenya, and I went to Ghana. And this image is an image of a midwife in Ethiopia, and she's sharing with me one of the herbs that she uses in the practice of her birth. And I'm hoping at some point to do some work with the University of Ghana to do some scientific studies that look at some of the herbs that the midwives in Alabama talked about and the midwives in Africa talked about in terms of their practices. I've already said that about the spiritual connections, um, which are very powerful and very strong. And it's not just spiritual connections in terms of identifying what religion, what faith, but it has to do also with what, are, what, are, what is the caregiver doing to calm the mother? What is the caregiver doing to make the mother comfortable? So when they have this shared space in terms of spiritual practices, in Alabama, practically all of the midwives said they prayed with their moms. All of the midwives said practically, they hummed spirituals or songs or hymns. Practically all of the midwives said that even before they went out on a birth, they would pray. Um, so that they were clothed in their own spirituality. And the same thing on the continent, whether it was Muslim or whether they were practicing their own traditional um, religions, there was this idea that there was this integration between what we see as a biological medical event, but it was far more holistic that it was including plant medicine, it was including spirituality, um, it was including um, rituals. And I'll talk a little bit more about the rituals. Um, the rituals were important because, again, it was a, that making that connection with the spiritual base. And one of the rituals that was very common was burying the afterbirth. And that was across the continent as well as in Alabama, and I'm sure in Mississippi as well. It's a very strong black tradition. So I was really interested because again, the health department supervisors would say to the midwives, you're doing something that has, makes no sense, it has no relevance to the birthing idea. But when I was in, on the continent, when I found out how cross-cultural, um, not only on the continent, but you know, Women have been having babies since the beginning of time. Doctors recently began, I mean, in the 1800s. <laughs> so we're talking about, you know, Egypt, indigenous, uh, South America, uh, and uh, women were the, the providers of the care. And so there are many traditions, like um, not just burying the afterbirth that has a spiritual component, but also traditions that are 
now being shown to be very scientific and very, um, uh, the Journal of Medicine will talk about the importance of not lying flat on your back to have, to give birth, that there's so much value in being in the upright position, a stooping position. And again, those are traditions. But when the doctors came into the birthing room, they made it more of a surgical idea. So it was, they weren't seeing the mother's face. Sometimes it was covered. They were just looking at that, the birth canal. And so it's a completely different experience. Biddy Mason um, is one of the most celebrated midwives uh, in the country. And I really didn't know much about Biddy Mason until recently because I was doing most of my work in Alabama. But Biddy Mason was an enslaved midwife who um, moved with her enslaver to California. And once in California, she became aware of the law and she was able to go to court and be emancipated. Prior to being emancipated, she had worked as a midwife on the plantations where she had attended both black and white women. Some of the midwives who were enslaved actually got paid, um, and some were able to keep the money that they were paid. It was just a couple of dollars. But um, Thomas Jefferson, had, uh, Rachel was her name, was it, and that's in the book, um, was on the plantation, and she was able from time to time to collect a small amount of money for her work. So Biddy Mason was not only a midwife, but she died um, in dollar terms, a millionaire because she was also a really smart businesswoman. She helped to find the um, African and Methodist Episcopal Church in California. Um, she was totally committed to social action and social work. But what I did not know until about two years ago, when I was reading, um, someone had sent me an article in the New York Times, which shows the mural that you're seeing there. And so here is this midwife um, involved with a medical operation and assisting a medical doctor. Um, and this is, again, in the prior to emancipation. And the way that this um, incredible mural was discovered is that there was a historian who was working um, at the university in California, an uh, architectural historian, and she was watching them take down murals in this medical, what was formerly the medical school teaching, like here, that murals up, the paintings up. And she recognized Biddy Mason, and they were in the process of destroying this mural. And so the New York Times, she did everything, she's on a campaign, she's still on a campaign, um, but the New York Times published this story with this image. And I think it shows also that the midwife, in many instances, and in some instances, was much more than a birthing attendant. I've been pretty clear about how midwives have been honored, respected um, in all kinds of ways. But what I was surprised to learn when I was doing my work back in 1981 is that some of the midwives were um, multitasking. There was one midwife who was a midwife and a school teacher at one point. At one point, she was a midwife and a school principal in Alabama. And she, I said, well, how did you do that? She said, I worked it out with the superintendent because they knew there was nobody else but me, right? And then when she was doing her, her work and when she tells her story in the book, she also talks about how she helped um, mothers when doctors would say, oh, this baby doesn't need to be, this is in the later years now, I'm now going into the 50s and the 60s. This mother does not need to be in a hospital. She had delivered triplets. And she had called the doctor and said, I think this, these babies need observation. So now we're in the era of Jim Crow segregation. And she, the babies, the doctor said no. So she became the caregiver, not only at the time of birth, but she said, on my way to school, I would check on the babies and on my way back from school. But the other thing that's amazing is about this connection, right, within the community that doesn't happen now with doctors who are not living in the community who do not have established relationships with the community. These women knew, they knew the, this teacher, for example, knew the mom before the baby that she delivered was born. They were going to the same church. They were respected because they were also leaders. They might be the director of the choir. So uh, they weren't meeting someone for the first time 
at the time of delivery. They had this established relationship. And I also talk about in the book that some of the midwives also provided something that we're talking about now for the first time, end of life kind of doula care, right? The doulas now are working a lot with supporting women at the time of birth. But again, the midwife that uh, Chester Higgins' aunt talks, his aunt, he talks about her, she was not only a midwife, she would be the one that families would call on to sit with a dying member of the family. So they had this very uh, sense of respect for holistic care. Um, Chester said when his aunt walked into church, everyone stood up. Um, others have said they would see the midwife sitting on the porch and they would always pause and give, you know, the, the, the honoring could just be a wave. Uh, another friend of mine said who had moved to New Jersey, he said whenever I went back to Selma, I always went to see the midwife who delivered me because there was that kind of respect and honor for her. So this is Toni Morrison, and with her hands up in the hair, um, giving praise to her grandmother, who was a midwife. And she said, again, any time her grandmother walked in the room, the men stood up, because she was more than a midwife. She was the wisdom keeper. She was someone that was deeply honored in the community. These images, I think, are important to pay attention to because these images come from All My Babies, and it was made in the 1950s in Georgia, Alabama. Um, and George Stoney was the director of the film, and that film has now been preserved by the Library of Congress as a film that should be preserved for all time. It was designed as a training film for midwives in the 50s, and it was the first time that they were actually filming a midwife who was licensed to practice in Albany, Georgia, showing best practices. And this is an image that's called um, timing contractions. And again, not using instruments, but using their hands, um, using their ears, um, using touch um, as a way of, of practice. And this midwife also delivered hundreds and hundreds of babies. Uh, Miss Mary is her name. And I was a part of an initiative that was done at the Anacostia Museum, which is part of the um, Smithsonian Museum. And some of these, and that was maybe in the 19, maybe early 2000. And I collected the images that were in that um, exhibition. And currently, some of the images from that exhibition are um, on view at the African American Museum in DC. And there is an exhibition called Enterprising Midwives at the African American Smithsonian Museum. Um, and this is, you know, giving the baby um, a first bath. I'm not sure if it's right after the birth or later. But when I look at this, I remember when I gave birth, I was petrified about giving the baby the first bath. And my mother didn't really understand it, so, but my aunt did. So my aunt actually came over as, and was with me as I gave my daughter Ghana Frisco Tashi Smith um, her first name, Ajua, because we did a naming ceremony for her, and so her first name is Ajua. But just having someone with you, um, for having the midwife coming back for those visits, um, having someone with you at the time of birth, women gathered at the time of birth. It wasn't just the midwife, it was the women down the road, it could have been an aunt, but it was a collective communal experience, and that was the same in Africa. So again, they were very, you know, it was very structured in, te in terms of the goals. I mean, just wanting to show washing of hands, giving the bath, but it's also showing the love, right, um, in the image. And this is uh, one of my favorites, <laughs> yeah. And we talk about, we think about midwives in terms of, they're often talked about in terms of their high infant mortality rates. Um, and Margaret Charles Smith, I know, um, had maybe two or three stillborns, but again, she's dealing with, working with a high risk population by our definitions now. You know, women who were working in the field, were women who, um, I think though that they had a better access to nutritional food though, because they were growing their own food as opposed to the McDonald's 
And they were also active, right, because they were farm workers. So um, there was a study that was done by the CDC in North Carolina in the 1970s, just as the midwives were being phased out. And they looked, and it was published um, in the, I think it was the National Institute of Health, I'm not quite sure, but a, a, an esteemed scientific journal. And it was, it showed that the, quote, granny midwives had outcomes that were slightly but not significantly um, significant to the doctors. And what they were looking and how they structured this was that they were certain that the women were getting prenatal care that was, de was designed by the health department, that they were getting um, you know, counseling advice. So the prenatal part was equal for the doctors and for the traditional granny midwives. But when it came to the outcomes, the granny midwives actually did better. And so that's something that really, it's a study that would really is worthy of follow-up so what were the midwives doing that were different from what the doctors were doing that led to those positive outcomes? So I'm going to conclude just by saying that for the first time, I'm seeing in communities recognition of the traditional midwives. And this is in, in Virginia, um, where there is a monument for, that's a picture of one of the midwives there. And it's, um, it's growing. Um, Margaret Charles Smith, that I said, is in the Women's um, History Museum in Alabama. Um, there's a campaign for a stamp for a midwife. And I think that there's the truth about it's being known that whenever you go into the black community for a certain age group and you say, how did you get born? And they would say, a midwife. So there's just millions, <laughs> millions of folks who came into the world through the hands of a midwife. And I'm, I'm going to um, conclude with a reading, but I just want to mention the, the birthing justice movement. Because the birthing justice movement, did I see someone with a t-shirt on with birthing justice on her? Maybe she's no longer here. Um, birthing equity is a strong, 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 strong uh, campaign that's going on now. Because when we look at the infant mortality rates and the disparities of black mothers, black babies being two to three times more likely to die in the course of childbirth. And now that is, you know, at one point they thought, well, if we get everybody in the hospital and we deregulate, we get, wipe out the granny midwives, then we're going to see equity. And that, of course, has not been the case. And when I was at the health department, the thought was, it's because the women are poor or they don't have a good education. But these two ladies, um, Serena and Beyonce, really turned that upside down. Because here were women who had access to the best hospitals, the best doctors, and were still feeling that they weren't being listened to um, as midwives. And I'm going to conclude with just reading um, one more passage from the book. Because I, and this is my personal tribute to this particular midwife, um, Rosie Aaron Smith, and how it affected me personally. Midwives taught me how to listen, just like they listen to know when time come for folk to get born. Midwives also taught me how to talk to God. All kinds of trouble can rise up when bringing life into the world in a one-room, unlit cabin with no heat, as Alabama midwives told me. That's when midwives say they'd be talking to God just like they'd be talking to any other man. In 1981, when my work interviewing midwives began in Alabama, I spent more time with Rosie Aaron Smith on the porch of her home than I did with any of the other 50 midwives whose stories I recorded in Alabama. Whenever I needed to sit with Miss Rosie, I knew the 85-year-old retired midwife would be sitting outdoors like midwives used to do when waiting for someone to come to take them out to care for the mother or wait on the mother, as Miss Rosie would say. I never called to let Miss Rosie know I was coming, but she was always there. Because Rosie lived alone in her three-room house built just across from her daughter's trailer, which seemed to be permanently parked in the yard. I could go straight to talking to Miss Rosie with having, without having to greet or chat with others. When Rosie spoke, her words floated into the Alabama heat and released a soft breeze that felt like a seductive goddess in the woods cooling the air. On Rosie's porch, which connected a front porch, a back porch, and a side porch, 
She would look out toward her garden and say things like, don't need no fertilizer to grow this corn, just hum. I learned from Rosie that hums also carried the pain and sorrow, and sorrow that marked enslavement, Jim Crow, and struggle like in the 60s when black men and women sat on their front porches with guns to protect their families. And through all those times, midwives like Rosie Smith helped black babies to get born. While sitting on her porch saying goodbye, Miss Rosie let me know that I would see her again and that the work I was doing would continue. On my last visit with Miss Rosie after interviewing midwives in 1981, Miss Rosie was wearing the everyday cotton polka dotted brown dress adorned with buttons that I always saw her wearing. Her clothes, her porch, the house that she helped her sons to build look worn, but the strength of her spirit guided me in the writing of this book. This book celebrates Rosie Aaron Smith and all the midwives who've been kind enough to share their stories with me. And I thank you for being kind enough to listen to me <laughs> tell, tell these stories. Thank you.